This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. Many thousands of tourists fly in from all over the world to the island of Mauritius. They land where a bird that never could fly became world famous. Mauritius was its only home. Allegedly, its name came from a man called Charles Dodgson. He had a stammer and would sometimes introduce himself as D -D Dodgson. The dodo, the same word as extinct, dead as the dodo. Here in the West Indian Ocean on Mauritius was thought to be the last known remnants of what was truly an extraordinary creature, an epitaph to man's short-sighted greed which has also threatened other very rare birds. Once this not ex-parrot but ex-giant pigeon would have looked out across a wild and beautiful island. Modern man has altered all that, or nearly so, and brought foreign species that fly across Mauritius as part of massive change. At the time of the last dodo, about 1662, just 100 years after it was discovered, there were no big fancy hotels, of course, but there are now. The dodo was the price of progress, though hopefully we behave better these days. Or do we? We'll see if we can turn losers into winners, but it's much too late for this very special one. Bird visitors from the far north winter here, and so do the human migrants. Both have the beach to themselves, but for how long? Part of the appeal of Mauritius is its wild beauty, as yet this place is spared the bulldozers. It's upmarket, classic blue sea, sand and swimming. Today, the only dodos tourists will see are the many various souvenirs. The real thing is dead and gone long ago. Had they met one, they would have found it very tame, unable to fly, a recipe for disaster, back when they were easily killed for food by passing sailors. Dead as a dodo is a dubious claim to fame, exploited by Mauritius's tourism brochures. The nearest a tourist might get to the real thing would be in the local museum. From a giant flightless pigeon to a smaller sort that can fly, the pink pigeon was almost a dodo, as we'll see, down to 10. Same with this, the echo parakeet, the last echoes, down to 12. So, one famously extinct, the no-no, the dodo, zero, nil. The other two, nearly so at one time. But what next? And there's even another, down to just four birds at one point, the Mauritius kestrel. This is the story of how to turn likely losers into maybe winners. One of the problems has been the vegetation. Dodos fed on fruits, nuts and land crabs. In a few places the original forest survives, but like most everything in nature, in Mauritius it's been changed. That affects the inhabitants and it could be a white-tailed tropic bird looking for a nesting cavity in a mature tree. It's quite a problem, one that it shares with the endangered echo parakeet.
that could be someone's home. Rich original diversity will be replaced by a sterile monoculture. With forest gone, the soil is exposed, washed away by tropical storms, leaving a sort of desert, a green and brown one, sugar cut and uncut. Nothing much lives in these sweet prairies. Jobs, income, yes, but now we know much more about rotting teeth in young children, obesity and diabetes. Some other vegetation may exist amongst the sugar or on the hills, but that in itself can be another problem. As a flightless ground nesting bird, some said good to eat, or roasted perhaps, the dodo was always going to be a loser. Island flora and fauna is always under pressure, from the Galapagos to New Zealand, to some of the remotest rocks in the biggest oceans. In the Indian Ocean, Mauritius, Réunion and Madagascar have suffered greatly. Although the intentions may have been innocent, people like to bring familiar neighbours, but the impact of such aliens can be a disaster. Deer overgraze and they're over here. Few trees can grow back, even if they try, and even some trees are the wrong sort. But of course, this is venison on the hoof. farmed deer. A miner, a sort of starling, common now around the tropics. And another success, if you like monkeys I suppose. And always on the lookout, especially upwards, the mongoose. Killing snakes may be good news, but its impact on other native wildlife can be devastating. Pink feet, pink pigeon, they were hanging on for deer life, uh, not those deer, with only ten individuals left. So looking to the future, was there any hope for this pretty gentle species? And there's a killer down there, though it's only trying to survive, as being a mongoose. And the echo parakeet is only trying to survive too, nearly down as low as the pigeon, which is at 10, and the parakeet's at 12 in the world. And the winner is, or rather the biggest potential loser is, the Mauritius kestrel. Very sadly, at a very mere four birds anywhere. Surely a dead end. As dead as a dodo? The competition is intense, and fatal in fact. In the early 17th century, the small numbers of settlers introduced pigs, dogs, cats, rats and monkeys, which would have all plundered dodo nests and competed with the birds for limited food resources. Eggs and hatchlings turned into yet more man-friendly immigrants. One wonders what a dodo chick looked like. From all directions and in many ways, Mauritius and its unique ecology was under attack. From munching giant snails to harmless looking foreign sparrows. Along with the opportunistic bold miners, the competition was fierce. The original inhabitants seemed defenceless and withdrew under the alien onslaught. The tropic bird we saw earlier, looking for a nest site in a hollow tree, crashed. 
There's now a scarcity as the original forest has been much reduced, with the result that the very rare echo parakeets down to 10 birds now compete with a much commoner tropic bird, an elegant far-ranging ocean wanderer. Back at the lab, the wing is checked, a particularly crucial part of his lifestyle and caused indirectly by human destruction of the forest, which connects to the parakeet too. Go around then, okay. Sorry. Okay. Right wing. If you see. Okay. Got him. He's pretty lively, so probably... Okay, I'll get it. Okay. Yeah, hold him underneath it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. See what's happened? Oh, uh, yeah, he's lost all his. And if you look under here... Yes. He's incredibly bruised. Oh, wow. Okay. All down here. Come on. Teddy. Teddy. Just relax, Amy. Yeah. I think they're down a bit. Depends if he's ripped the tissue off. Depends if he's damaged the follicles permanently. That's going to be the main problem. Yeah, we're just going to have to wait for that to, to go down, I think, around yeah. here. Because they should be coming here. Come straight out. See, yeah. And because it's so swollen. Into the mow. Um, Wait for it to go down another couple of days. I'll feed him up. He's pretty chubby. See, it depends if he can compensate without those primaries. I know. If he can fly without them, which he might be able to do. Well, we took out a load of sandwiches. Yeah. The end ones are the biggest yeah. problem. From pink pigeons to golden bats, Mauritius is certainly a colourful place. He must change his point of view from an upside down descent to a close up view of the fruit salad. What's it going to be today? Orange for a golden fruit bat. And the pink pigeon gets his lunch via a tube. And thanks. As for the kestrel, it's al fresco outside. With careful feeding, protection and nesting opportunities, the numbers are creeping back from the near disastrous four. Yes, only four. Normal food is lizards and geckos, small birds and insects. This is a bonus. Not sure. There's a lot going on today, but it's good he's so adaptable to traffic and people, however crazy they may seem. Perhaps a possible nesting cliff makes it an attractive location with a kestrel des res. When the dodo team turn up to check how it's all going, well it is. So with artificial feeding, a flourishing gecko population in the wild, protection and provision of nest boxes like a tree cavity, Gradually, kestrel numbers increased. By 1991, there were at least 30 wild nesting pairs in a population of 170 birds in four forested but separate areas of the island. Three years later, 346 young kestrels had been released back into the wild. The population reached some 500. But was that safe at the end of the 1990s? 
So how is it looking from the pink pigeon's point of view in the survival stakes? Well, not bad, in fact better. Like the kestrel, the right support is provided, be it a breeding or a feeding place. And he's getting help from his friend, who's actually today on parakeet duty at a box that beats a pigeon, as we'll see. Okay. Meanwhile, back in the trees, the pigeon feeds on buds, shoots, fruits, seeds and leaves. This is the main feeding area, producing healthy, fertile pigeons and parakeets. Just what the conservationists ordered. Because the original vegetation has been invaded and beaten by aggressive Chinese guava and privet, this feeding station is an answer. Tailor made for a hungry parakeet. Or two. Or three. You can see tameness, as in the case of the unsuspecting dodo, where it proves suicidal, may be appealing to us, but it could be devastating to a species. Most parrots are pretty clever and make popular pets, but often via a dubious trade. Their survival in the wild is threatened. But what about these echo parakeets? Will they become echoes of the past? The last pink pigeon, the last Mauritius kestrel, the last echo parakeet. Could they still follow the last dodo into oblivion? Last seen, apparently, in 1662. Now this pigeon seems alarmed, but it's all in a good cause. Are these parakeets at risk? Might he steal the eggs or take the chicks for the wretched pet trade? Just borrowing it for the bag. Yeah, fine. Job done, one of the very few and valuable tree cavities in this forest that has changed so much to the serious disadvantage to parakeets and indeed that injured tropic bird. Not nearly so rare and now back flying again. But is this trouble? Right. They collect a parakeet chick. 
more weighing. Writing is blind and naked and on a journey. Perhaps he's carrying the future of the species and it's in his hands. Then another walk through the woods on the parakeet trail. Okay, yeah, parakeet perfect. From the mountains to the coast, to a place which may become a safety belt for the three no-dozos, they hope. The Kestrel. the pink pigeon, up from 10 in 1991 to a population in the wild of 450 in 2011, plus a healthy captive population as backup. The perky parakeet is doing well too, from just 12 known individuals to about 700 these days. And here comes another one to its new home for a while. Here's a pair that will probably breed in captivity, thereby hopefully defeating the dodo effect. It's a great team effort encouraged by success turning Mauritius's losers into winners so far. It's proving a classic example of what can be done with good research, tough field work and financial support. Save the parakeet. Defy the dodo. Okay. Oh, he's quite big. Yeah, 50 grams. Hello. Hello, Dantari. Empty crocodile. Quite all right. And he could do with a feed. Hmm? Hello. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So this is the end of part one, the story so far, with the question, any more dodos? To be updated next time in part two. Just walk away, that's it. The biggest challenge has been the Mauritius Kestrel, a great success for Professor Carl Jones, a crusader for some 40 years. And when I went to Mauritius, it was 
working with the rare birds. And I started with the pink pigeon and the Mauritius kestrel, both of which were critically endangered at the time. And the kestrel in the 1970s went down to single figures. In 1974, there were only four individuals left in the wild. And we were able to restore that with captive breeding and reintroduction. And then we moved on to the pigeon, the parrot. And then in more recent years, we've been working on the endangered passerines, the small songbirds in Mauritius. But I've always enjoyed going and working on the remote islands. And I always thought, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we could really restore these? And of course, Jerry Durrell was, was always very interested in Round Island, and we had many of the reptiles here in the zoo. And it was always our goal to try and put those islands back to something like they would have looked like before man modified them and introduced rabbits and goats. So what started very modestly, breeding the odd bird in a cage and thinking that one day we might be able to release them, it's grown into a movement on the island, restoring uh, the native habitats, putting back these critically endangered species and training people, the next generation of young conservation biologists.